van de popmuziek. Zo wordt hij wel genoemd, de inmiddels 44-jarige Engelse popzanger Sting. Binnen 14 dagen zal zijn nieuwe cd Mercury Falling ook in Nederland op de markt verschijnen. Voor de opname daarvan heeft Sting zich omringd met diverse Amerikaanse artiesten, zoals The Memphis Horns, die vroeger nog met Elvis Presley meespeelde, de jazzmusicus Kenny Kirkland en zelfs een complete gospelgroep. Nog steeds heeft Sting verspreid over de hele wereld miljoenen fans, ook al is iedereen het erover eens dat er sinds Roxanne, Walking on the Moon en Don't Stand So Close to Me wel het een en ander is veranderd. I had the idea that I, I, I could, I would love to make my living as a musician. I would love to be a musician. That was my only ambition, and still is my only ambition, to make my living out of playing music. I, I have no one particular music form that I, I want to, to sell or, or dig deep in. I, I like to be a gadfly, you know, I like to roam around. basis that you can say what you like in a pop song as if you're writing short stories or plays or even novels whatever it is it's really the opposite you know you take uh, you take big ideas and you condense them into rhyming couplets you know whereas uh, novels seem to be the, you take small ideas and make them into a big narrative um, you have to be sparse with words you have to you have to write a story in very few words and I, I think uh, I think it's a great art form. Do you find it, it, it was um, difficult for others to accept that, that, uh, that you could put rather complex messages and uh, rather abstruse references into, uh, into rock and pop songs? 
if, if the idea comes, I'm not constricted by the idea that oh, you can't do that in a pop song. I'm really not. You can't put that word in a pop song. You, you can't put that meter in a pop song. Or, I don't care about those rules. I really don't. Mm. But I'm privileged, you know. I, I've, I'm uh, in a position where I can do that. You know, I've, I've made enough money to have that freedom. Um, people will, will listen to my records with, with more... Um, with, I think they'll, they'll give me enough rope to hang myself, basically. I was never in the school choir because I considered singing to be something that was a bit sissy. And yet, you know, when the, when the school sang, I had this very sweet voice. The first hit record I ever performed on was a song called Roxanne. What was it you think that made the police click? I think we, we were a, um, a three-piece group. And that, that, that has an in, inbuilt limitation. You're just three people. You can't really compete with a, a larger band. It has keyboards and you know horn sections and lots of singers. And we started to leave lots of space in the music, lots of holes, <laughs> because we couldn't fill it. But we made, a, we made a point of that, and I, I think that spare kind of skeletal approach made any record we made stick out. The police was radically different. The great space created just by three instruments uh, was added to by Andy's, you know, that shimmering sort of echoey guitar. And then what's particularly great about Stuart's playing was all the stuff on the hi-hats really clever it just tri now you listen to it a lot in dance music but it just trips the whole thing along like keeps you going like that so the bass is holding a, a melodic pattern which is reggae jazz influenced <laughs> And then this voice, his fantastic voice. And there weren't great voices at that period. You know my mind is made up. So put away your makeup, yeah. Jolie wants it, I will tell you again. I will share you with another boy. Roxanne! You don't have to put on the red light. Roxanne! Our timing was very good when we came to the States. The American media and the American audience were aware that there was something called punk happening in England. We had this great song, Roxanne. We were all pretty articulate. We were able to give very good interviews and talk about punk and new wave music. And then we, we had the performance to back it up. Punk happened, uh, the Sex Pistols and the Clash, and they seemed to be knocking the doors in. So 
that was we, we flew the flag of punk to get in through the door and then we became ourselves white reggae was a phrase used about the early songs wasn't it really I mean, re reggae was, a, was a, a type of music that uh, appealed to me as, as a musician not not about energy but as, as, a, as a bass player particularly i was i was fascinated by bob marley and his voice and his, his, his uh, songwriting abilities and uh ended up emulating them because reggae the sort of musical end of the punk thing Reggae is hard. When we were listening to Catch a Fire, the Marley album, it took us ages to just pull back and just relax into this thing, you know. And that's a, a huge pros. They could do it. I mean, he's such a good bass player. All dressed up and nowhere to go, no. Welcome to this free man show. I always sort of avoided the cliche of like a rock star buying a big uh, house in the country because I'm a city boy, you know, I was brought up in Newcastle and I've lived in London for the past 20 years, but um, I decided that I would try it, buy a house in the country and see what it was like and I love it. What do you think you got out of your background just in simply in terms of your career? I didn't really appreciate it at the time. I tended to... Uh, to live in a sort of monochrome world, you know, sort of grey streets and grey skies, and was attracted by uh, the cinema, by Technicolor, you know. I thought, well, that's that's real life. And uh, but looking or back, it isn't real life. Well, it's not real life at all. That was, <laughs> it was more better. attractive. It's more. I, I come out of the pictures and go, God, I'm back. <laughs> but looking back on it, being born next to a river and a shipyard and the the remnants of heavy industry it actually was a fascinating and a very stimulating background but i thought it was just somewhere to escape from I always think about a symbol for my life being the, the shipyard I live next to, of these giant ships they would build, which would be built for, you know, 18 months, and then they'd launch them into the river and then out to sea, never to come back. I always thought that was an image for my life, you know. I'm building myself up here, then I'm going to get launched and I'm going to be out into the world, you know. And my father was uh, an engineer, a fit, an engineer's fitter, and, he, and he, he worked in the yards. My grandfather was a shipwright. Uh, there was this tradition of, of work. I never aspired to this. I wanted to read books. <laughs> what, what made you want to be a school teacher? Um, uh, basically, the holidays seemed, <laughs> seemed <laughs> <laughs> and the hours seemed, you know. I mean, uh, when I was a teacher, when I was a student teacher, I was a musician. I was playing every night in, in clubs and pubs. And so I needed a job that wasn't. Um, too physically taxing, and uh, that's what I thought. Teach, I school. thought teaching was an easy job, and I, I realised very quickly it wasn't. But the hours were good. Mm. I, I was playing every night, turning up for school the next day, and, and uh, what was hard about it? Uh, it was the first experience, really, of performing in public, mm. <laughs> of standing up in front of a class and actually performing. I mean, what I learned was that there's no such thing as teaching. What happens in a classroom is learning, and you're basically there to encourage that feat, you know, that, that, that phenomena. And I found the best way to do that was to entertain the children. Whether they learned anything, I do not know, but I definitely could entertain them. I, I, 
develop a taste for jazz quite early and quite deliberately. Uh, and it's music I didn't really like at first. I mean, someone lent me uh, Thelonious Monks playing solo. And I sat there and listened to this stuff and knew it was going to do me good. <laughs> I would eventually learn what was happening and eventually I did. I think a, a taste in jazz music is something you have to learn. You can't just suddenly... It's not something you have naturally. Since we started playing jazz tunes, we come in here every day and play a tune. I started writing out stuff. Uh, and play Keith Jarrett tunes and McCoy Tyler tunes. This thing is a musician first, you know. And instead of like a pop icon, I think he's a, he's a musician strongly. I said, when we, when we go on the road, we have to get a gig in a, a little smoky club, just to, me and him playing jazz tunes. So, so we're getting our repertoire together. up stumps and came to London. Now that was a, a big move in anybody's life at that particular time. Wife, child on way, giving up teaching, coming to a place where you knew hardly anybody. What were you going to do? I was in a bank called Last Exit. We decided that we would go to London. And uh, I think uh, there's only me and a keyboard player who actually made it. And uh, the others, other guy stayed at home. But uh, once I was in London, I decided to stick it out and I, I signed on the doll and I, I was lucky. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I met Stuart Copeland and we formed the, the police and, you know, 18 months later we had a hit record, which is a, a miracle. Now, I don't think any of us ever consciously thought, hmm, what is there that hasn't been tried before? How about if we... I don't think any of us ever did that. And, and when we came together forming the, the sound of the group, we never really scratched our heads to look for something different or trying to be different. I think it was all completely instinctive. I think they clearly knew what they were about. Highly ambitious. Uh, highly competitive. Um, very arrogant, which is very necessary. To learn. And an absolute... They were so sure of themselves. I remember that. I really remember that about they were so sure of themselves. I don't know, but uh, I remember Sting and thinking, he's a cocky bastard, you know. <laughs> we were all of us so committed to succeeding at that point that we just didn't question whether we would or not. And if anything had gone wrong, it would all have collapsed. But nothing did, it just kept getting better and better. <laughs> A few years later, it was several hundred thousand people at concerts. It was 11 million records. Did that give you a sort of sense of vertigo? I mean, how do you cope with that? <laughs> um, well, I did cope with it. I mean, I'm still alive. And I think uh, it's partly a function of, of, of being 26. I wasn't 18. I wasn't 19. I mean, that kind of success... At that age, it's very dangerous because it's usually, it passes very quickly and then you reach the grand old age of 22 and what do you do? Um, I'd at least developed uh, as an as a adult before any of this happened and still 
I, I still fell foul of the traps, you know. I mean, I've led a pretty wild and profligate life, but I've survived it because I, it's, it's been balanced, you know, by by thought, <laughs> by a certain amount of discipline. Um, I mean, did you feel threatened by the success at some stages? Because it, well, I mean, it must be an overwhelming feeling of sort of power and, and just be knocked off your feet. I know that the most successful period of my life was probably in the early 80s. It was also the most unhappy period of my life. I had gallons and gallons of money and, and success and adulation. And yet my life was crumbling around me. My marriage was falling apart. My personality was falling apart. My relationship with the other members of the band was falling apart. And this was the most successful time. We were absolutely, you know, coining it. And uh, a, a terrible paradox, you know. This is what we've, we've been working for for years and years. Now we have it, and it means absolutely nothing. <laughs> She said once since that, that success was more important than their relationships. I said that. I think I believed it. I don't anymore. I really don't. I mean, it's full of fear, isn't it? I would guess there's a lot of fear, though. Yeah, you're frightened that it will it will end, even though you're not having such a great time. After all, you you don't want it to end. And, you know, all all of the crutches are there waiting for you. You know, uh, drugs and uh, alcohol and and women and everything else. You know. Um, I was glad, I'm glad to have lived that life. I'm glad to have survived it. As the, you know, the, uh, the nurturing uh, environment of the group began to dissolve and a lot of the um, aggression began to rise, uh, that it became more competitive and, and other things other than the quality of the material began to raise their, you know, rear its ugly head. Bands tend to be, um, you know, young men, a, a gang. And I found myself, the older I got, less and less willing to be a member of the gang. And the songs I wrote reflected it less and less. Yeah, you know, Stuart and I both wrote songs about, uh, as it went on, I thought I wrote some very good pop songs, but Sting wasn't really up for singing other people's material. I found it a terrific strain to be wanting to write in a certain way, with a certain freedom, and yet having to, to deal with this group consciousness, you know. difficult to write and they're the songs that in a veiled way will reveal something of myself that I would normally hide normally try and uh, mask and I'm talking about vulnerability fear weakness um, it's, it's not something I project normally in a normal life and yet it's part of my personality, obviously. And, and the best songs reveal that. And uh, they're the most difficult to write technically, the most difficult to write emotionally. But they're probably the songs I'm, I'm most proud of.
I try and live a pretty routine life. When I wake up in the morning, my first duty, if you like, is to do yoga for a couple of hours a day. It started off as a sort of keep fit thing and be, it's become something more substantial. I'm totally uh, addicted to it now. I, I find it helps my mind as well as my body. And I can do things now with my body I couldn't do when I was 16, which is exciting, actually. Moving to the country was a major step for me. And now I'm perfectly happy just wandering around the woods all day. I spent a lot of my life totally ignorant of nature. I lived in a city, I didn't really see trees, flowers. And quite late in my life I came to realize how important they are to me. This is my hut by the river. I actually spend most of my days in here. It's very peaceful. I can look out the window, there's a river flowing. I'm quite happy living here. I don't need the big house. It's very funny. They bring me my meals down. That's a nice sleep here. We have a song called I Was Brought to My Senses, and it's really about nature and, and seeing nature as a metaphor for human relationships, but also as a revelation in itself. I was visited the Amazon 10 years ago. I was completely fascinated how, how beautiful it was, how amazing, how vast, and became very involved in trying to prevent its destruction. Got in a lot of trouble over that. <laughs> We're asking President Sane to, to give us world leadership here, and taking a step to, to save the environment. Out of the confusion, well, the river meets the sea. What, what, what's your overall view of that now? What's your overall take on your involvement with that? Um, I mean, I'm glad that we got a result. I'm glad that we managed to, to physically and politically demarcate an area that's the size of Switzerland, actually. And uh, that, was what we, that was our goal. That was what we set out to do. And it took five years of, of very hard work to do that. Um, I'm very ha happy about that. What I'm not happy about is some people get the impression that that was some sort of self-serving uh, idea that I was doing it to further my own fame or my own career. And in fact, the opposite is true. <laughs> my career took a dive because of that. Uh, Why do you think it took a dive? I don't know. I took a lot of flack for it. Um, Again, it's just, you know, human nature. I mean, your, your job is to, is to focus attention on an issue in this, as a celebrity. 
And when you focus attention, you have 50% of that attention is going to be negative. You know, that's, a, that's an equation you have to come to terms with. And we did a tour years ago with Bruce Springsteen and Peter Gabriel for Amnesty. And we played in places like Argentina and Chile. And the local journalist would say, you know, how, how do you think your songs are going to affect uh, General Pinochet, you know, whatever. I said, probably not much. Uh, probably he's never, never hear our songs. But his grandchildren will. They will rule the country one day. That's all we can do. We're singers, we're not politicians. Yeah, I've been called pretentious a lot. I get asked to represent ideas as a celebrity, you know, so you add your name to this or appear here. But I'm fairly selective about what I do now. Otherwise people think, oh, it's thing on a soapbox again, you know, it's boring. the Don Blonde syndrome. Marilyn Monroe was not allowed to have brains and that continues to this day. No blonde pretty girl is allowed to have brains. Uh, well, you can extrapolate that to a blonde pretty pop star. Rock stars and footballers are supposed to be idiot savants, you know. We're not supposed to have read Proust. <laughs> Sting's thing about the overt pursuit of the intellectual, you know, books, um, and, and being very influenced by those books, whether momentarily or whatever, he seems to digest what that thing has, take what he needs from it and spit the rest out and then wrap it up in a song and move on. He deals the cards as a meditation And those he plays never suspect He doesn't play it's very hard to write something that's entirely original. I would say it's virtually impossible. A lot of songs have the same chord structure, the same shape as a million other songs. Jack. It's not nice. I've got chest pains. Is that the phone for me? It's the Samaritans. What? <laughs> Yeah, we need more of those. Whether or not you like my music, I mean, that's not a given. It, what comes through me is me. It's very much me. And it sounds like me and nobody else. Even though I'm using old established forms, you know, I'm using a major chord followed by a relative minor. It's been used a hundred million times. And yet, just by doing it yourself, singing it, Using your words, you, you produce something that is original. Actually, looks like the Elvis. Elvis? Yeah. Well, I just heard that these guys play with Elvis Presley, you know, I'm, so I'm a bit <laughs> freaked out now. <laughs> Southern sure. gentleman, you too. You say I'm southern sometimes, Jane. Really? You say some things in South Jersey. That's like you're from Tennessee. <laughs> Never heard that before. South, South London. Maybe. South London. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find out for you. <laughs> so you can work on it. Those two guys played on all those records. They played on Soul Man. They played on Knock on Wood. They played on Hold On, I'm Coming. They played on Dock, Dock of the Bay. They played with Elvis Presley. You know, that's the sound you have in your head when you think of stacks and you think of soul music. I mean, our calling card is the 60s. That's where we went to college. We went to college at Stax Records. And our degree is Otis Redding, and Sam and Dave, and Wilson Pickett. In rhythm and blues.
I just thought it was an authentic uh, quote from that era. So, okay, let's take this out of that historical era and see what happens. One, two! <laughs> My head is in 9-8 time, and it's not an, a normal time signature for anyone. The Memphis Horns haven't played in it before, so it was quite difficult to get them to feel the rhythm. Okay. Yeah. Um, the last one wasn't good. Yeah, do them all again. <laughs> no, the, the G to the F is on the, the eighth and the ninth beat of the bar, so it's ba ba da ba da da. Thing likes all these strange, uh, what we call them, strange time signatures. We listened to a tape before we left uh, while we were at home that had, uh, it was in a 7-8. Uh, rhythm. Then we got over here. I was prepared for seven eight, and Sting says, "All right, how about nine eight? Five six seven eight nine. player and be a singer and be a band leader is a very happy accident. The band is top and bottom by me. I'm controlling the whole thing. And within that, the band can paint their own colors, but I'm very much dictating the harmony and the top line. Um, also, you, you control the dynamic. The drummer can flail away, but without the bass underpinning him or complementing him, it doesn't work. playing the bass. It's big and chunky, it's got big strings and I love the sound of the bass. When I was a kid, to hear the bass better on records I would play 45s at 78 and I'd play LPs 33, I'd play them at 45 so the bass would come out and I'd hear the bass lines. I was fascinated by bass. Still am. I mean, they're pretty ugly, my hands. They're, they're made for playing the bass or punching people. <laughs> it's better to play the bass. I have a 
foot in both rooms, if you like. One, I'm very much a popular artist with a popular appeal. Uh, on the other hand, I, I like this kind of weird stuff. So I'm trying to pull people from one room into another. I like selling a lot of records. I like being a popular artist, but I can't be a pop star all my life. I will move and probably move away from a popular arena and probably no one will hear it except the dog. I'm in my 40s now. My generation doesn't really listen to pop music that much. I don't know where it's going. I have grown up through pop music. Like most people of my generation, I, I can landmark my life with songs. You know, I know what I was doing when a certain song was in the charts. I've grown out of it. I don't do that anymore. Thank you. Sting, of all the bass players I've ever known in my life, you're one of them. Thank you. Is it true? I can now landmark my life in my, in my own work. I don't know where I was when I was making a certain album or writing a certain song. Okay, everybody. After three. 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 Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. I'd like to say a few words. I I'm very fortunate tonight because it's my birthday and I have both of my families around this table. I have my lovely wife, I have three of my six children, I have my band, and I've reached the age of 44. I'm very healthy, I'm very happy, my sanity is reasonably intact, and I owe it to my family, so love you all, God bless you, thank you. Fifteen years ago, ten years ago, everyone knew who was number one. I have no idea who's number one at the moment, I don't care. And most people in the country don't care either. It's sad, we seem to have lost one of the things that was very cohesive about our society, you know. It's, it's just too disparate. And I think the same is true in television, you know. I think I've said this before, but uh, every Wednesday night, the whole country watched the Wednesday play and discussed it the next week, or all next week, or they watched Armchair Theatre. Because we had you know, basically one channel, and that was a very cohesive force. We've lost that. There are too many channels, there's too much pop music, there are too many choices, and so we don't have these artistic expressions which everybody can relate to or everybody can comment on because none, nobody sees them. And you see this is a loss? I mean, people could say, look, this is varied, this is... This is uh this is postmodern. Well, it's, it's multiple. It's varied. It's it's not as constrained. This was constricting. Yeah, I preferred it. When I was in my twenties, I was very confident and very sure about what I was doing. And I really felt I had my finger on a pulse. I kept having number one singles and stuff like that. I don't have that anymore. So I, I make music that I like. I'm running out of handshakes now. How are you doing? Good to see you. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Nice to see you. We've sat now. Let's go from. Uh, and the distance seems so strange to me now. In the dark, will we come in for that real long part? Okay. One, two, three. Let your pain be my sorrow. One, two, three. Let your pain be my sorrow. 
screen. Let your tears. Hey, give me the ah. Ah. Beautiful. So don't forget the let your pain. What is it? What's the lyric on the second chorus? I'm confused. Let your pain be my sorrow. Yeah. Be my sorrow. My, my. Let your, your. Just be the colored children that you are. <laughs> just, just be those black children. Just go on and serve it. <laughs> let your soul. Let your soul. Soul is it. Guide you along the way. Let your soul. No. Let your soul. Let your soul. Let your soul. Monica, we're just we're ending up at the word soul, just just a, a fraction too early. Let your soul. Let your soul. Let your soul. Guide you along the way. Let your soul. I think might open the can of worms there. <laughs> Sometimes it's better to leave problems alone. See, it doesn't matter if you're black or white. You can listen to soul music and then try and sing it, and you can mimic it. Or you can listen to it and get into it. Sting is a real soul singer when he wants to sing soul. When there's no is a paradoxical person. What makes him more relaxed now is that he recognizes the paradoxes. He still does his hair but will laugh about it. He still does his yoga. He still twats on about tantric sex, you know? And, uh, you know, stuff like that. I mean, uh, but like now he sees the joke, you know? Eyes turn towards the window.
But um, in that sense, you think you've managed to guard the, an essential privacy, despite all that? I think so. I think so. I, I mean, I don't mind what's said about me in the papers. I really yeah. don't. No. No. I don't. I don't care. <laughs>